Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast, the podcast dedicated to simplifying the commercial real estate industry for the masses. Each week, we sit down with industry experts to dissect the many facets of commercial real estate and extract valuable lessons you can apply to your business. Whether you're a new or seasoned business owner or investor, the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast will be your go-to resource for all your commercial real estate needs. Now, here are your hosts, Rafael Collazo and Jeff Walston. Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast. I'm your host, Rafael Collazo, here with my co-host, Jeff Walston. How's it going, my friend? Going great. And uh, like I always say, 2022, uh, as far as business, is looking up. Uh, it's going well, even though uh, I'm not sure about the economy and how that's that's going and uh, what's going on out there. Uh, but other than that, it's going great. Uh, getting ready to celebrate uh, my wife's uh, birthday this weekend. Um, and so I'm you know, preparing for that, doing all the planning and stuff. So I'm pretty excited. Uh, what about you, Raphael? How's it going for you? It's going well. It's going well. Can't complain. I actually uh, just got the, the proof copy for my latest book before you buy that building. So we're going to be hopefully having a release or a launch party here soon. Uh, obviously, Jeff, you will be invited. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm excited to get that done. It's, it's taken up a little bit of my time over the last year or so. Uh, and so we're really excited to just get that launched. But, you know, speaking of just a phenomenal conversation, we had a great uh, opportunity to meet Tim Wright, who's an associate with Avis, Avis and Young in Atlanta. Uh, young guy, awesome, driven individual. And so we really got to talk about a variety of different things uh, that I think you guys will gain some value from. Uh, first and foremost, we talked a little bit about his backstory, how he got into the commercial space. Uh, and, you know, at first, his interest in commercial real estate started off with a big project that he was involved in uh, with a, a very high profile individual, which I'm sure you guys are going to learn about. And you guys are going to hopefully gain some insight from that as well. We talked a little bit about some of the strategies that he uses to generate business on a variety of different platforms, but primarily uh, LinkedIn. We also talked on some of the things that you know he sees some of his early or his business clients you know fal uh, falter on, or some of the pitfalls that they experience as they're going through the process of leasing space. You know, setting expectations early on is a common theme that you know both operate that both people in the brokerage space and you know Jeff is in the commercial construction space. He's had to do that very. Uh, very much so over the last couple of years with all the different delays and supply chain issues that, that have occurred over the last you know couple of years. And then finally, we touched on a little bit on his efforts on the social media platforms and how it's helped uh, as far as generation of, of business. And then finally, uh, you know what his thoughts are on, on Atlanta uh, and the future of the market as a whole. So I thought it was a great conversation. You know, Tim's a real cool guy. I haven't been to Atlanta yet. And so we kept on saying like, I'm going to be, when we come to Atlanta, we definitely need to check out uh, some of the restaurants along the Beltway and really just take advantage of the city. So, uh, Jeff, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, uh, I just think the the positivity and optimism that Tim has uh, for his market in Atlanta, uh, that's what I grabbed from him. Uh, and especially just his journey uh, for all, all of you uh, CRE that just got in. Uh, it's very similar to most people go through who doesn't have the help of uh, being in like a family or knowing someone in the commercial real estate agent uh, industry. Uh, but I, I, story is very similar, but a little bit different. And so I'm excited for you guys to listen up for that. So. Absolutely. And, and he, he will share something at the end of the podcast as part of the commercial real estate treasure chest, which I think if you guys are newer in the business, you definitely want to take advantage of, um, you know, I'm going to be reading it and, and, and taking advantage of it as well. Cause I think there's definitely some value I can gain uh, from from the the topic as well. But uh, before we get started with the podcast, I just, again, every episode we do this, but I just greatly appreciate and Jeff and I greatly appreciate uh, your guys' support over the last several years, se about a year, just over a year now. It's crazy to think that we've been doing this as long as we have, but you know, we've seen a significant uptick in our downloads as of late. And I think a big reason for that, and Jeff and I uh, you know, I've been tracking the data and seeing the statistics. And I think a big reason for that has been your guys' support on the review front. Uh, so if you guys don't mind going to Apple Podcasts, if you haven't already, and leaving us a five-star review, it really does make a difference. And it makes a, a huge impact in our ability to be able to reach a broader audience so they can learn about the many facets of commercial real estate. So, uh, Jeff? Uh, I just also wanted to say, if you're listening to this, I'm going to start saying in every episode, our other ask is uh, to, to uh, share the podcast with someone just one other person. Uh, if you think they would gain value from it, or even if they're interested and they mention it to you, just 
you know, share it, please share uh, to, to get more listeners. Uh, Cause you know, we're, we're trying to help out as many people as we can. So we appreciate it guys. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, and like, like Jeff said, I mean, if they have any, it doesn't even have, it matter if you have interest. I mean, there's a lot of yeah. valuable insights value. that you can gain from just the stories and discussions that we have that, you know, hopefully can add value to other people. So if you don't mind, like Jeff said, sharing it as well, it makes a big difference in our ability to be able to reach a broad, the broadest audience possible. So again, thank you all so much for that. So without further ado, let's go ahead and drop and dive right into the podcast. Well, good morning, Tim. Great to see you this, uh, this fine morning. Yeah, good morning. I oh, appreciate you coming on the show. Oh, for sure. It's yeah. going to be a good time. Excited about yeah. it. Absolutely. Yeah. And for those of you guys who are listening to the podcast, uh, Tim's tuning in from Atlanta, a place that I've been to many times as far as the airport's concerned, but I've not had a chance to explore myself. So hopefully looking forward to getting out there to actually check out the city. I've heard great things. So, you know, yeah. I'm sure I'm sure you can speak to it. Yeah. Next time you're in, we'll we'll get some lunch or something. It's um, it's a little hot and uh, the air's a little thick right now, but mm-hmm. overall we're doing good. Well, it's not called I, hot, hot yeah. Atlanta. It's called hot Atlanta for a reason, right? Especially yeah. in the summertime. <laughs> to everyone that's not here, <laughs> you, you get you get the the look of shame if you call it hot Atlanta over here in Atlanta. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. Well, Tim, it's an honor to have you on the podcast. We're really excited to dive in a little bit in your backstory. You're you're a little bit newer in your career, but you've made a pretty decent size impact uh, just through you know your efforts on a variety of different mediums. And so we're kind of le- excited to learn a little bit more about your story. So if you don't mind, kind of sharing a little bit about yourself, I think that'd be helpful. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, on paper, it looks like I've, I've been at Avis and Young. I've just coming up on two years now. Um, I got my license about five years ago. Um, mm-hmm. So winding the clock way back, I grew up in Peachtree City. If you haven't heard of it, it's a little town. We're famous for our whole, we have a whole road system for golf carts. And it's, um, it's about an hour south of Atlanta. So I grew up there, just normal suburb life. And um, but yeah, my, my dad took a job there. Just, it was pretty much from like middle school on. But then, um, I left and, and did like a 18 month overseas mission trip and um, went to like 16 countries, lived in Australia, New Zealand, a bunch of other places. And um, when I got back, the um, movie industry, you know, Pinewood that had moved into like my parents' backyard like 10 minutes away. And there was all sorts of you know people moving dirt around. And I just had no idea what commercial real estate was. I, I didn't know what development was. But I was like, this is cool. Let me get involved. And they had a, a breakfast meeting every Wednesday. And I would, I would just show, it was open to the public. People could, you know, share their thoughts of what was happening and um, just a cool place to network. And so I started meeting some of the players. And um, Dan Cathy was one of the um, main advocates. He's still one of the, it's now Trillith. I think he's like a majority owner. And um, he, he was hanging around there. So that's, that was the CEO of Chick-fil-A at the time. Um, and now I think his son is, has taken over in the last year, but, um, so I got to meet him and then some commercial real estate people. And I was like, I don't know anything about this, but I can, you know, make flyers and a website. And so I convinced them to let me hang around. So yeah, within, within a couple of months, I was sitting at the table with Dan Cathy and all these big fish and they're talking about creating a city out of a farm. It was just like a pasture of just grass at the time. And now it's, I mean, it's this huge, um, it's got like 40 something sound stages and, like a whole town. So it was, it was really eye opening. I, it was only for a couple months and then I, I went off and um, moved up to Atlanta to finish up my undergrad. Um, but that was like the, okay, this is what I want to do. This is, this is pretty freaking cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, that, Go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. Oh, I, you were just mentioning Chick-fil-A. I know that they uh, started from there and I know Elena is speaking of hot, as you said, you guys said earlier, it's like a hot market. I, I believe, uh, Papa John's moved their uh, corporate office now down to Atlanta. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a growing market down there. I, I'm excited to see what happens and in the next five, 10 years with Atlanta. And I, I know it's a, uh, I don't know what the necessarily the draw is for all the corporations, but uh, it, it seems like they're, they're moving down there fairly quickly. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can, we could go into that now or in a bit it's um i mean that the off the cusp it's it's the diversity it's here it's the access to talent it's it, the affordability and i think it just has yeah. a lot of momentum i feel like every week there's announcements for some company that's moving to town yeah so we're on the up and up we're trying to hey. make sure we uh <laughs> take advantage of it i know you said that uh you, you kind of told us your interest in commercial but i, I know that's in our real estate sector on that but why didn't you choose residential? Was there 
like not a draw at all there or are you just (laughs) yeah (laughs) no I I was just like anything that has to do with houses or this personal emotional decision I don't want to be doing open houses and getting balloons and cookies on Saturdays it's like there's nothing about that that appeals to me so um yeah that that's why um yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. And, 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 and that kind of, that kind of, you know, is something that a lot of our guests that we've interviewed yeah. have kind of referenced is that, you know, it, it's almost like a different personality type that's kind of attracted to that yeah. industry. And, you know, I've, I've been in the business for about three years now. I was in, I was in it before I was an engineer. And when I was okay. making the decision of why I wanted to go one way or the other, that played a huge factor into why I chose the commercial side. It's like, yeah. you know, you're dealing a lot more with business owners and, you know, especially if you're on the yeah. investment sales side, it's like very numbers heavy, which is something that, you know, if you're a business, if you, if you have business acumen, then you'd say, okay, this is kind of the route that yeah. you want to take. So there's, there's more levers to pull. There's problems to solve. It's like, it's, mm-hmm. it's yeah, there's a lot more intellectually attractive than, uh, you know, walking and you know, driving around town with some people who are trying to buy a house. So, but yeah, that's it. I get it, man. And, and so yeah. one of the things I wanted to, you know, touch on is that, you know, Similar to you, like, you know, when you first get started in the career of commercial real estate, what are some of the struggles that you faced, you know, and, and in particular, you, you've been with Davis and Young for about two years now, but even before then, you had been delving into the commercial real estate space. What was some of the early struggles that you faced? A lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I think I, anybody that asked me about getting into commercial real estate, I, I honestly tell them don't because of how, how much it was. Uh, it just, I had so many setbacks, man. I'll, I'll give you the, so. So it's this cool, you know, like inspiring six month little run around with, with the Pinewood development. Um, after that, I, so I, I worked with a guy down there. We did some investment sales. It's down in Peachtree City. Um, we did some retail leasing, sold a church in East Point. So we did some, some little transactions here and there, but I, I really wasn't making any money. I, I had like a, I don't know, some hourly rate with him. I was building websites and, you know, that sort of thing. But um, I realized it was like, yeah, Atlanta's way bigger. I need to move up there. There's so much, so much more product. People are just on a different level. And so when I moved up here, um, there's a couple of things that happened. I was, I was rounding out my last year at Georgia State, which is in downtown. And then I, I met my wife. Um, we were pretty quick. I think it was from the moment we met to when we got married, it was like 15 months. Um, so real quick on that. And then, so yeah, we get married and I graduate. And this is like all within like two months of each other and it's 2019. And so I, at that point, I was like, am I gonna you know, go into commercial real estate like full on or am I gonna do this marketing thing? Cause I'm good at it, but I know that the ceiling is pretty low for marketing compared to what you can do in you know, leasing and investment sales and stuff. So I, um, I remember I started interviewing with some people. I interviewed with Cressa, um, Lean Associates, a couple other companies. And I don't wanna say this, it, Maybe it was a mistake. I don't know. Maybe the guy that I, I worked with will be listening to this in a year from now. But I, Keller Williams was where I ended up landing. My, my father-in-law, he introduced me to some people at, at Keller Williams' office. He's a residential agent. And I was like, oh, why the hell not? And, you know, the, the splits are great. And it's, you know, I'll just hit the ground running. Everybody says, you know, like, it's uh, eat, eat what you kill. So I'll just, you know, get after it. So I, I realized really quick, and maybe three or four months in. I mean, I hit the ground running. I went to every networking event. I, you, you scroll back in my LinkedIn. I remember I made this post. I had this like stack of business cards. It was like five or 600 business cards. I was like, this is what I did to get my first client. And the first client was like a thousand square feet for like a year long lease. So I made like $300 on it. And, um, but I, I felt like I was like, you know, getting somewhere. But, you know, as time goes, I, I started talking with some of my friends that they got into, you know, Transwestern or JLL or CB and, the stuff they're talking about, they're like, oh yeah, we're running around town with a 20,000 footer. And I was like, ah, man, maybe I need a, <laughs> maybe this isn't like the best place. And, you know, you just realize it's, it's so relationship heavy. Like who's going to trust this like 20 something year old kid running around. And, and then Keller Williams, just the like, uh, it, they're a great platform. I think they're really building out. But if, if you're like brand new, that's uh, just don't, don't go there. If you're, if you've already been in the industry for 30 or 40 years and you're just like, you got your clients. That's a great place to be. Um, but you need to be around young people. You'd be around mentorship. You need to be around like energy and um, sort of a, a corporate environment. Like so when I switched over to Ace and Young, it was like night and day. So just coming back to like, you know, to talk about struggles. Um, so it was a really hard 
couple months because you know we just got married. I wasn't making any money. I made three hundred bucks after six months, and yeah, my wife's like looking at me. Are we really doing this? <laughs> you know, we got bills, buddy. And um, I just I remember like watching our savings account just like deplete in those first couple months. And oh, man, and so I, I started interviewing again with some companies, and um, I got really far along with Transwestern and a couple others, and and then out of nowhere I got introduced to this group at JLL. And they were one of their like the top teams at, at JLL. And um, I was talking to Avis and Young a little bit. I don't think we had really like, I don't know. I, I had like one breakfast with the managing partner here. Um, but JLL came out of nowhere. They're like, hey, you should join this team. Um, we do a bunch of healthcare stuff and whatever. And I was like, yes, that sounds great. And ended up getting the job. And I, I had an offer letter in the mail coming. And then COVID happened. And so it was like one step back to the next, like my start date, I think it was like March 3rd. And I had flown down to um, like Tampa. They were like, just come on tours with us. You know, you just like you know, get your feet wet so you can hit the ground running when, when you know, you sign all the papers and, and get going. So, so yeah, Covenant have JLL sent out a, a global hiring freeze and I was on my couch for months. And I, yeah, there, you know, in high school, there's times where it's like, maybe you're like depressed or whatever. I had like a, a pretty bad stint of that in like 10th grade, but this was like another wave where I just remember my wife would leave, she'd go to work, she worked for an interior design firm. And I just, I would like sit at the kitchen table, just depressed. And I just remember my body was like, you need whiskey right now. <laughs> and it's, it's like nine in the morning. I was like, I'm not in a healthy spot at all right now. And I need to figure out something. So I started, doing all the adventures in commercial real estate stuff. I discovered Justin Cavell, breaking the CRE, all his courses. I just turned into like a spreadsheet junkie and was, I was like, you know, if I, if I can't really like, you know, do deals right now, people aren't hiring, whatever, then I'm just going to, I'm going to get good at, you know, all this other stuff that I can. I worked with a bunch of nonprofits. I still have marketing uh, clients. So like I was, we weren't like dirt poor, but mm -hmm. we were, we were making it. It was just, I was like, I need to stick this out. And, um, yeah, it was, it was a hard, I mean, COVID was hard on so many people, but it was just, the time it couldn't have been worse because I was, you know, it was it was a, a tough six months to get in going. And I, I felt like, you know, we we're making some good, like a good breakthrough. And then that got dissipated as well. So rounding out 2020, um, about August, September, that's when I, we really kicked up the conversation with Avis and Young. And um, I just, I felt so good about it. The, the culture, the values, all that my partner, Doug, that I work with, it just, it felt like such a natural fit. And, um, that's where, that's where I ended up. So yeah, since, since then that, that was where I guess I hit the map or hit, hit the road on all the marketing stuff that you've probably seen on LinkedIn. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. And, and yeah. I have almost an identical story to you. I, I started in July of 2019 uh, in the broker space. Oh yeah. Nice. Yeah. So literally, literally the, the like the yeah. exact same time and similar to you, the first six months, I think I made, so I had the, my first deal was like two months in, it was like a 1200 square foot office deal is a five-year lease. So I ended up making like a grand or 1500 bucks. And yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. okay, everyone was saying, oh, it's going to take you like six months to close your first deal. I did it in two months. And I was like, oh, this is going to be, you know, easy. Yeah. And yeah. then three and a half, almost four months later, I closed like a small retail, uh, industrial, like investment deal. It was like eight and nine grand is in gross commission. Then COVID yeah. hit. And I, and I had started yeah. to build up some momentum and literally like you, I was sitting at home for like two and a half months with my fiance, my girlfriend that at the time now fiance, like same thing. Yeah. She's looking at you like, all right, what's going yeah, on? Yeah. You, know, you left Did your, you say you, you yeah. can make money in this career, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like you left, yeah. you left your, you know, engineering, software engineering and consulting job to do this yeah. stuff. And it's like, okay, you know, it's yeah. like, <laughs> it's just like the pressure is coming in from everywhere. And, it, and, and I think it's important that you talked about, you know, the mental health piece of things, because it is super stressful as a career path. And particularly when you first start out that, you know, some people yeah. don't think about that. They they see the 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 potential that you can achieve in in the commercial brokerage space, but they don't think about what it takes to actually get there. The people who are making the you know whatever you're you're aspiring to make, they put in the time for years in order to make sure they can actually achieve that level. And so I'm I'm yeah. thankful that you're able to kind of talk a little bit about that because it is an important topic to discuss. Yeah, I, I think you know, sure people are like born into a real estate family and maybe sure. they have it yeah. a little easier, but yeah, for it's just, it's just the reality of it. I don't, I don't see how people are, you know, you hear these stories where like, oh yeah, I quit my job and I made four times as much as I ever made in the first year. I just, some of those stories, they just don't sound real. It's like, 
maybe they have this deal lined up or something, but yeah. that just kind of like off and on switch. Absolutely. And one of my buddies, so one of my, one of my buddies in the fraternity, I was in a fraternity in college and one of my fraternity brothers, he uh, was working with his, his, his father. They own like a vineyard in, in, okay. in California. And then he went to LA and he went to, to Marcus Milchap and he said his first year he made like 25 or 30 grand and he made 28,000 cold calls. 28,000. He was making a hundred calls a day for like the entire year. And then the next year he obviously yeah. hit, you know, the, the I think he, he did quarter of a million, but with that much effort. So imagine that, you know, it's just like wow. the, 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 and talk about a mental health drain. I mean, when you're doing that level of, you know, out cold outreach. So it's one of those things yeah. where, yeah, maybe. And if, if he achieved that level of success, it's because he just had a steel resolve and that's all he did literally for six hours a day, seven hours a day. And then, it, you know, then, then yeah. Marcus Milchap, it's a little different. Cause they have like, once you get the deal in, like the operating team takes it from start to finish. So it's just, you're essentially a hunter. That's it. That's all you do. So, you know, again, well, there are stories out there like that, but yeah. you know, the, 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 <laughs> yeah. there's, there's difference. There's a difference there. So that's why they're the stories. Yeah. You hear the stories as that mm -hmm. not everybody's a story. So, no, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, no. But, so yeah. I appreciate the insight for sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I know you spoke a little bit on the struggles of when you got started, but can you elaborate like on the celebrations, the, uh, the lead, the, how to get to those opportunities and, and particularly like lead generation, what exactly do you do? Uh, or what is your strategy, uh, to, uh, to get those leads? Yeah. Um, I was really bad at it at first. I don't think I didn't have any, any real training. Um, so, I mean, my thought was just meet everybody in town and eventually it you know, comes around. So I was just literally networking events. That was at any, any event that would, that would come up, I'd go to, there was um, like BNI was something I explored for a little bit. There's a couple other, those referral networks. Uh, there's stuff that you can get in them. For me, it just, I don't know, everything that was like a referral just felt, it was like a thousand foot office deal. And, and yeah, didn't, didn't make a lot of sense to like, I'm sure, you know, people could make money off of that, but um, I wanted to go for, for other things. So the, um, yeah, that, that was the original strategy. I mean, my business development, it's, it's changed so much. We we have like a, a very uh, well-oiled machine that is, um, got, you know, just tons of emails sitting out every week. Um, call, like it's, yeah, that, I, I, could, I could really go into all the science of it, but um, yeah, the, the early ones were, yeah, just, you know, networking bunch. But I, I also, I mean, I'll, I'll dive into the LinkedIn stuff. The... Um, I started figuring out that, you know, nobody really gives a crap about, you know, the, oh, I'm so honored to do this, or I'm so great. You know, there's, LinkedIn just has this, everybody's so thrilled because they're great kind of posts. And I just, <laughs> maybe it's going to change over time. I hope it does. But it, it just feels like this brag. So my thought was, I was like, well, what if I actually post stuff that, I mean, I find interesting, maybe other people will find it interesting. And so overnight, my post went from like 100 views to you know 500 views a piece and then i was like oh, maybe there's something here and now i mean it's it's gone from 500 views to like 5,000 views like if that's like the average so it's it's turned into this okay how many eyeballs can i get on my posts and then they'll probably click on oh who's this tim wright guy i've seen him a couple of times oh he does leasing oh he does commercial real estate oh cool well maybe we should reach out and i've, I've gotten like a fair amount of deals like i, I have revenue that's been produced straight from linkedin and um because a lot, I mean, I'll post like on, you know, history and oh, this building, you know, in 1970s and people that are, you know, managing partners at law firms or whatever, they're like, oh, I, I've worked in that building when I was a, a junior partner, or some early, I don't, just, just like, oh, early in my career, just that nostalgia kind of trigger. So they'll, they'll message me and then I don't know, I'll message back and say, hey, do y'all have any leasing needs? And they'll be like, nope, see ya. But then you follow up, you know, a couple months later and you end up winning them over. Um, so yeah, that that was like, and I, when I started figuring that out, like, oh, if you can make interesting stuff that people are engaging with, you're gonna be way, way better off than the uh, look at me kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I hope that I guess answered your question. That's just a, a small component of what I do, but uh, well, yeah, absolutely, I mean, yeah. Yeah, the the value add piece is the is the biggest thing, and and I think you know, give, given the fact that you know you want to establish yourself as that leader within that market, 
it's a long-term approach. It's not like you can yeah. automatically, like we just talked about, turn on a switch and all of a sudden, you know, business is flooding in. It's it's one of those things where, in particular, when we're dealing with larger transactions, I mean, for a lot of for a lot of our business owner clients or investor clients, I mean, you may, may be talking several million dollars for different deals that you're operating in. And obviously for leasing, it's a, it's a commitment over a multi-year time frame. So, you know, you really have to become that trusted advisor. It's almost like the financial services industries and, you know, the insurance, especially if you're getting more into like the, the industrial side of things, like th those are the types of professions that require you to build a reputation before people start trusting you. And especially yeah. early on in your career, because like you said early on, like, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a top executive at a firm and I want, I'm looking for 10,000 square feet of, of space, am I going to yeah. trust someone who has a little bit more gray hair or am I going to to trust someone who, you know, is a little bit younger in their career? I mean, you know, there's, there's a, there's a delineation there as well. Yeah. So. And it's even the, the thought process of like, even amongst your friends and family, like I got, you know, I've got friends that are, they've just jumped into real estate or, or they're I don't know, do, doing something that like wealth management, mortgage loan, whatever. It's in my head. I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I trust you yet. You're a good friend, but like, let me, let me let you, you know, fester on this. And then once you hit that like two or three year mark, then you just get that stamp of approval. So that, I mean, that's why it's like, I don't know, in my own thought process, like I'm not going to send you stuff just yet. So just, yeah, hang around. I get it. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and that comes with the struggles that, that you talked about, but, but again, it, yeah. it, it's the value add piece and, you know, givers gain is, yeah. you know, the B and I motto. It's like you, 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 you get put out into the world, put out into the world, put out into the world. And at some point it comes back to you. And I'm Gary Vanderschuk has the book, uh, uh, jab, 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 right hook, another type of same type of concept. It's like, keep adding value, keep adding value, keep adding value. And then you ask at some point, you know? Yeah, that's right. So, so, so what are some of the common pitfalls? So obviously, you know, you represent clients. You're on the tenant rep side. Is that correct? Yeah. So you represent clients that are seeking space for their business needs. What are some of the common pitfalls that you see some of your clients make uh, as you go through the process of trying to find them a space to fit their needs? Uh, I mean, there's a few. I, th I think a lot of people think that they're going to, you know, get this awesome space in like two months. Like a lot of people call it like, yeah, we need to be in and the desk and, and the office like in two months from now. And it's like, yeah, you, you can, you definitely do that. Uh, if you go to like we work, but, or we find you a, a spec suite, but then you still have to order furniture and you got, you know, other stuff. So I, I, it was just the timing, not realize how many hurdles you really have to go through, especially for like a traditional, you have to go through all the uh, lease negotiations and like find it, finding the space and getting the terms, like you can knock that out in a couple of weeks. That's like kind of long even. Um, but it's all the other stuff and the build out and the permitting. It just takes forever. So yeah, uh, from from like a business strategy perspective, I think not giving enough time is that's the most common. Have you been have you been have you noticed that you've had to educate your 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 clients more, especially now with with the environment the way it's been and oh, especially yeah. over the last couple of years. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure Atlanta has been you know it's 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 hot as ever. So. You know, there's always changing yeah. landscapes. Like, so you you had you feel like you've had to educate your clients a little bit more about the landscape yeah. as a whole. Yeah, we we've got a bunch of graphics. It's like here, it's like very very simply like laid out. It's like okay, I know you think this is all you think about is like we're gonna go tour space, we're gonna find it, we're gonna get a good deal. Like this is this is like all, but it's like all the stuff behind it. That's why this takes so freaking long. So I know you don't want to think about it right now, but really do. And um, so yeah, and we have those conversations. We'll also say like I'm sure you've heard construction costs are high everything's on like a big lead time supply chain issues it's like i know we're really tired of hearing it but it is a reality and I, it's usually the first conversations we have it's like okay let's get engaged with a furniture vendor let's go ahead and like realize your bill that's going to probably take a little longer so if you need temp space or whichever so yeah those those are yeah out, out the gate conversations it's always good to like you know curb expectations so they're not looking at you like what the heck i thought we were going to be you know done with this by now yeah i mean so I'm a commercial GC, uh, and so educating clients um, just how the market is doing, especially with the build out and the duration. Uh, you know, they're coming in with the two month, you know, whole build out, and it's like, well, you know, we probably won't even be able to get your countertops in mm -hmm. for you know two, three or, months or, perm so. or permits. Permits, yeah, permits, yeah. permits in two months. You know, it's yeah, like it's, <laughs> those were the worst, but it it, it just. Uh, the education and how much value that that gives and that's a 
that's one thing that I, I try to push to my clients is like, you know, I try to educate them at the very beginning. It's like, you know, if your other contractors aren't telling you this, you know, you, you're going to have be a rude awakening when you, you go into this deal. So uh, let's yeah. get it out of the way and set expectations, you know, not necessarily high, but on the lower side, because it's the reality of right now. And it's sad, but that's just what we face. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll even say this for, with Jeff, you know, cause I talk to Jeff a lot, obviously we're in the podcast together and, you know, we, we operate in the same sphere. So I always send over, yeah. you know, potential clients over to him as well. But, you know, one of the things that, that we face a lot of times with, especially startup clients, and I, and I do a lot on the retail side is that is this, the sticker shock that, that appears once they see what it's actually going to cost to build out of a space. Yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, they, they have this idea. It's like, oh yeah, we, with 20, 20,000 bucks or whatever. And, and obviously it depends on the build out and everything else. But if you're, if you're talking about any sizable build out, I mean, you're going to be talking a significant amount of investment that comes up front. And so, you know, a lot of times, you know, Jeff's, I mean, he's had to do this for, for, forever. It's like, all right, before I send you this, you know, we, I need to set this expectation for you right off the bat. So you understand that, yeah. you know, it's not going to cost, it's going to cost you way more than what you probably think to get right. this space where it needs to be. Yeah. And labor, labor costs. Yeah. I, I think the other struggle is like, it used to be the kind of the rule of thumb was, okay, three-year deal, you're signed for your lease. Okay. You're going to get it as is. We'll probably vacuum the space. Maybe we'll do creating carpet for you. Five year, five year used to be like, okay, you get a, a nice building standard sort of build out. But now it's like, oh, you need seven years, seven year deal. Like that's, that'll get you that. And then if you want, I don't know, anything extra, like it's, it's going to be out of pocket. And it's hard, you know, you work with people that are like, maybe 5,000 feet and to get them to wrap their head around like an eight or 10 year lease to get the bill up that they want. It's just doesn't work that way. It's just too small of a, a deal like the, the footprint that is. So yeah, that, that's been the other one is, I don't know, getting people to pallet a little longer lease term. So most people think like five years, oh my gosh, that's an eternity. Yeah. And, Especially with the changing landscape, COVID's obviously yeah. disrupted a lot of, you know, different property types and one being the office space. So, you know, yeah. people think they're like, okay, well, what, what is my office needs going to look like in five years? So yeah. that's, I'm sure yeah. something you guys are, are facing. We had talked to a gentleman in, in Houston uh, and he does a lot in the office space as well. And, you know, similar to probably Atlanta, it's like, you know, if you want a five-year lease, there's 50 other people want it right now. It's like, if you want, especially if it's furnished, he said that the furnished yeah. market is like, you know, good yeah. luck. Yeah. 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 That's, I would agree with that. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, so I know you spoke earlier about LinkedIn um, and the presence and getting views and stuff. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit more on that? Like uh, for instance, how like social media and just digital marketing in general has like expanded your business. Uh, and then on one other little tidbit to that is do you use any other social marketing, social media uh, platforms? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start with the second one. It's a little easier. Um, yeah. I don't do anything on Facebook. I, I barely use Instagram. Uh, my like handle on Instagram is like Tim Wright CRE, so Tim Wright Commercial Real Estate. So if I like comment on anybody's stuff, they're like, oh, what's that CRE? That's like all I see the, with the Instagram benefit. Just the, the algorithm doesn't reward you nearly as much as LinkedIn does. So I'm, I'm 110% LinkedIn. I just, I don't see any other yeah. platform competing with the input to output turn on investment of time. Yeah. Um, so you got to repeat the, the first question for me. Well, I was just kind of curious of, have you seen it, the, the potential growth and how have actually you, have you done that uh, within LinkedIn to, to get you, you know, maybe the a leads? Um, yeah. Is there a particular strategy or was there more than just your, I know, I know you said earlier that you uh, stuff that you're interested in and that's helped put, give you more views, but has that give you more leads? Yeah. It's, you know, that's something I've been thinking about a lot is I would say the first six months when I really started kind of refining my message and um, sort of online personality, if you want to call it that uh, there was, I, I think I got a lot more just, interest from like a vast array of different people yeah and i i think now that i've maybe linkedin's done this maybe there's you know some algorithm but i've i've been like very heavily pocketed into the commercial real estate space so it doesn't really suggest anybody for like you know follow recommendations or connection recommendations that aren't attached to some commercial real estate uh industry so maybe maybe that's just the algorithm that's changed um but yeah so 
so for leads and stuff, it it really has been. I mean, it used to be like I would get you know those direct messages, like I was saying, like oh, I, used, I was in that office building when I was younger. But now it, it's changed a lot to like, okay, these people are are consistently liking my posts. Maybe I'll reach out to them, and or if they're commenting on it, then I'll I'll engage with them more on that. Um, so yeah, the the direct messages. I, I think maybe the last one I got was a couple months ago. So it's just it's changed a little bit on like how I engage with people. Um, so yeah, that and um, I think you just learn, you know, after posting every day, like what what sticks with people or what media types do better. Like for me, it's it's a little bit of text and a picture, and that's it. I, my my videos do all right. I just I don't think like the view count doesn't do as much like a, a video versus a photo of almost the same subject matter. The photo will do let's say like five thousand views. The video will do like fifteen hundred. So it's still the same stuff, but it's just do people hang around and watch a video on LinkedIn? And um, maybe they maybe they do, but yeah, it just I don't think the platform pushes that media type as much. And it's always changing. I mean, you can look up different LinkedIn pros. I I don't want to claim that I'm any expert at it. I've just found that you know pictures and some text or that's what works for me. So maybe I should, you know, expand um, what I'm doing. No, I mean, it hey. seems great. Yeah. And, and, and LinkedIn, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of doubled down on LinkedIn as well as of late, um, you know, just because I see the, the potential long-term uh, on the yeah. platform. And then I also do a lot on the YouTube side of things, uh, which I found has found to be very helpful in particular, if you can rank for certain keywords, because YouTube okay. is, is, is the second most utilized search engine in the world outside of Google. So, you know, and when people go to, you know, learn about something, the first place that I go to is YouTube. So I could say, you know, what is X, Y, Z? Like if you could start ranking for some of those things and that's what I've been kind of pushing for hard uh, as of late, you know, that yeah. also can lead to opportunities. I've gotten several leads through that, through the, that, those mediums um, cool. just because I've been able to rank for certain keywords that I, that, that are high intent keywords. So another tidbit for those of you guys who are listening as well. And it seems like uh, LinkedIn is, like you said, Tim, that it's, uh, you get more views on your photos, you know, photos are after all, you know, worth a thousand words, you know, it's one of those old yeah. sayings, but uh, I, I do believe that the videos don't do as well. And I, I think like Raphael has uh, a key there is like, I think those are more so for YouTube and that's where, cause people are just scrolling yeah. LinkedIn. Right. It's like a newspaper, essentially a digital newspaper. And how I look yeah. at it is like they want to see a picture and then like a little bit of a a tit a snid, snippet of an article, so or something yeah. that you wrote. So absolutely, I think that but, the attention span for me on LinkedIn is is very short. Yeah. yeah. So if you're doing I, a I, video, it's like I, I don't got time for this. I, I'm keep scrolling. Right. So. Well, I will say this: like you know, we we do short clips for this podcast, and those actually have done pretty well, especially if you have like an attention grabbing headline and you utilize the yeah. captions. Like that, those actually do relatively well, depending on the topic. So, you know, if you, if you have a, someone talking about X, Y, Z, and you can make the, 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 you know, the, the title eye catching enough. And, and again, keeping them really short is the most important thing. Like under a minute, right. you should never have a three or four or five minute video. Cause no one's going to watch that thing on, on LinkedIn. YouTube's yeah. a little different, but obviously LinkedIn, it's just a different audience. So. Yeah. And also their, their user interface for videos <laughs> great like you click on it do you not click on it how do I get the audio going so yeah it's once they they might figure that out or it, it's a little easier but yeah. absolutely so you kind of touched on it a little bit but i want you to elaborate a little bit on it re regarding the future of atlanta obviously atlanta is one of the the, the big cities in the united states there's a lot yeah. of thing uh, businesses that are moving to the area on a regular basis uh obviously yum brands uh and papa john's were founded here i know papa john's uh, move their corporate headquarters to Atlanta for a variety of different reasons that you kind of alluded to offline a little bit. But if you can kind of elaborate a little bit about what the value proposition of Atlanta is, and then maybe if you can touch on, you know, where you see the market going over the next, you know, let's say four or five, 10 years. Okay. Do you want me to sound like a commercial or? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, yeah. you, you can, you yeah, can bring I, your own I flavor can. to it. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, so <laughs> the, the repeating themes that we hear are uh, it has best diverse talent pool that you can get access to. That's, that is like a high, high on the values of, you know, large corporations. So that's, that's number one. Uh, number two is cost of living. It's traditionally been a very undervalued market. Sadly, our rates have been, you know, pushed up on, on every product type. I mean, and then our, 
you know, apartment rents are going up. So it's, it's still there, but uh, less than it was maybe, you know, a couple of years ago, but um, so there's that. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's growing. It's um, the, you know, city too busy to hate. So it just, there's a lot of good, I mean, history behind it. But you wind the clock back. I know Birmingham and Atlanta were about the same size. And that was you know, back in the 1950s. And they had very different philosophies on how they wanted to go about business. Birmingham was, you know, let's reward just white business. Let's keep it, you know, exclusive. This is how we've always done it. And Atlanta was like, you know, you come here and do whatever. And I think that's just set them up for just such you know, huge success. And um, yeah, so I'm trying to, I, I, there's probably somebody who's got a better you know, grasp on the business history, but like the film, film incentive, that was a huge win for the city. Um, and it's just been so uh, focused, like hyper laser focused on how do we be the number one state for business? And they've, they've really done that for quite some time now. And um, so I, th I think that's it. I mean, the, the Rivian deal, that was ginormous. Um, Kia is doing, you know, an even bigger thing down in Savannah now. And the SK battery plant, those are all some ginormous wins. But um, the other thing, uh, yeah, it's like every week we just see some corporate headquarters that's coming here, show up in the Business Chronicle or something. And um, yeah, just uh, there's a lot of really positive momentum that's uh, that's coming about. So yeah, that's that's it. I, I've kind of listed the reasons why. I think you know going forward, we have a lot to work on. I think our infrastructure is like 20 years behind what it needs to be. Um, I mean, MARTA and the DC Metro started at the same time. And if you go to DC, like, you know, you can get around in the Metro. You don't, you don't need a car. Atlanta, it's like, okay, maybe if you go to, you know, Atlanta United game, you'll take MARTA. Or if you go to the Peachtree Road Race, outside of that, it's, it's not a, a heavily used asset. Or, you know, building marketing, well, everybody talks about it. They're like, oh, we're right next to the MARTA line. But it's such a, it's, it's a small, uh, percentage of people that are, you know, really utilizing it. So I, I, I guess looking forward, I, I'm hoping that we, we get some more of that. And um, I mean, the Beltline, have, have y'all heard of our, our famed uh, walking path, the Beltline? Okay, cool. So um, I'll give you the, the, the quick rundown. So back 2008, uh, this guy, Ryan Cabell, he's a Georgia Tech um, sort of urban planner guy, yeah, you can look him up, but he had this sort of thesis on there's this, this ring road that's an old and rail line around Atlanta. It's, it's sort of in the, in the city's core and it's just neglected. Like it's, it's just sat there. Nobody uses it anymore. So why don't we, you know, pave, pave a nice little walking path over it. And it's, I think it's about 22 miles around. Maybe it's a lot more than that. Maybe it's like just under 30, but that, that has like absolutely changed the game. They're going to put light rail next to the belt line itself. So it's, it's like an inner ring road. So, if you go down to Old Fourth Ward, which is like sort of pocket, that used to be just like a not great neighborhood. It was a don't don't go out there, you know, at night. It's just not a place you want to hang out. But it's it's virtually just changed the environment. It, people call it beachfront property. All the the properties that are along the Beltline, you go down there on the weekend, and um, there's just thousands of people, and and it has the highest rent rates right now. You look at like business core is around forty five bucks a foot. Over at Pond City Market, which is right on the belt line, that's like 60 something plus a foot. There's a huge, huge jump. But um, yeah, for some reason, you know, a little walking path created billions of dollars in uh, business. So that, that's a, a cool thing on the horizon. But yeah, we've, we've got a lot to work on. I'll, I'll stay. Yeah, we, we, which, we've had. Which city but, doesn't? I was just yeah. going to say, which which city doesn't has, you know, the things that they need to work on our yeah. I think ours is public transit uh, yeah. is a big one here. We, we have like the the city buses, but and then that's pretty much it. I mean, yeah, uh, I think they need a, a couple more avenues for people to to get around um, here in particular. So I, I like that idea of the, the belt on that's That's pretty cool. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And we, we, we've interviewed a few people that are in the urban development space, one being, uh, you know, we had Martha Weidman, who was more on the art side. She provides like art for a bunch of different commercial real estate uh, developers. And he, she utilizes, you know, different art to, to, to create like a theme for different buildings and stuff. And she talked about the, the walkability of the city and how it impacts ultimately business. Um, you know, yeah. if they make things more walkable and they, they provide, 
you know, art and, and, and other things that, that support, you know, the walkability of a space that immediately drives revenue for business and rent is a function of the sales that you can achieve for a site. So ultimately it drives rents as well. So, you know, it, it's really cool. And that's one thing that I want to learn more about is urban development because of that reason. And, you know, similar to you guys, we, we don't have a very strong uh, public transportation system. I, I actually went to school in Phoenix, uh, uh, in, in Arizona State. And while we were before I was there, and then leading up to while we were there, I mean, obviously, there was a light rail project that, that occurred there. They spent billions of dollars on this thing, and hardly ever anyone uses it. You know, it's just pretty much the students that go to, you know, campus, and then maybe a little bit outside of that, but it's not heavily utilized. So I think part of the reason is just the urban sprawl, you know, everything's so spread out, like being able to build the infrastructure that's necessary in order to connect all these different parts of the city that are miles and miles apart. It's just, it's very difficult to achieve. So yeah, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see. Hopefully you guys can solve the problem because I'm sure there's many cities around the country that are <laughs> facing a similar one. Yeah. That's uh, it's going to take a lot of money. <laughs> oh, it's going to take a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. And it may be worth it. I mean, yeah. do, doing yeah. the cost benefit analysis and seeing how, how to achieve it, especially if you can target areas where, you know, you know, there's going to be heavy foot traffic, you know? Yeah. I, I feel like any, any major city should have a, a rail system to their airport. I think that would be super helpful. I know I loved it when I lived in, I lived in DC for a couple of years. And if you go to Ronald Reagan national airport, there's a light rail that takes you directly to the, the station, like, to the actual airport, which was awesome. I mean, it makes it so much yeah. easier to be able to travel and, and, and navigate down there as well. So, you know, there's definitely nodes within the city where it would make sense to, to kind of invest the resources necessary to make it happen. So. Yeah. yeah. We just love our cars too much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Uh, Tim, uh, start rounding out the podcast here. I want to say we appreciate uh, all of your experience, your your story, and uh, just uh, telling us a little bit about yourself. We really appreciate you coming on and doing that and taking your time to, to do that. Uh, so one of the questions is to start rounding off is, what is the most impactful book that you've ever read? Uh, and it doesn't have to pertain to commercial real estate. Um, in general, it can just be something that started a trajectory of a life path change or anything along those lines yeah um there's a biography of arnold schwarzenegger he it's called total recall it's a really long book i'd recommend getting the audio version of it but his um his like i remember reading that in high school just like just so mind-blowing how much he was able to accomplish before he even became Mr. You know, Olympia became all famous. He, he had like a general contracting company. It was like a multimillionaire. And so he funded his um, Mr. Olympia and acting career, like in, totally separate from those careers, actually, like trying to find he, his, his goal was like, I don't want to be ever desperate to take a role that I don't want to play or do stuff that I don't want to do. So his, his story is unbelievable. So recommend that um, it'll just, you know, really get you fired up about you know, putting in the hours and um, sort of the grit, like his whole thing was just putting in the reps. But when he, you know, became governor, they run all these different scenarios of debates and he just would do it over and over and over. When he became the Terminator, he, you know, reload the gun blindfolded. He just did it over and over and over. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a good book. Recommend yeah. it. Dude, he's an impressive individual. And, and yeah. people, people yeah. see his characters and the comedies and they think, oh, this guy's like, you know, yeah. Yeah. The guy That's, is like a absolute savage and he's extremely right. intelligent, understands right. the dynamics of how things are going on. And he's, he was a savvy investor from the beginning. I mean, he's, he's yeah. funded, like you said, a lot of his career through his entrepreneurial dealings. And then he talks, I remember one interview I saw with him, it was about, uh, I think twins was one of the the movies he did with yeah. Danny DeVito. And he took yeah. on like a, I guess he took on a, a ownership stake in the, in the, in the movie. And although it wasn't his biggest hit of all time, I think Terminator was the biggest hit uh, from a gross revenue perspective. He made yeah. a absolute fortune on that movie because he kind of yeah. had the, the, the stake that he did within the, in the actual business. So. Yeah. Dude is brilliant. And I, I think his accent like, disarms people. They just mm -hmm. naturally don't want to give him the respect, but he's, uh, yeah, pretty phenomenal. That's awesome, man. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Well, well, Tim, thank yeah. you so much for stopping by. We greatly appreciate your time. I know you're busy, and you know we're 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 excited to see uh, you in the future and and where you go. And, and again, like I said, we're going to be in keeping in touch, and hopefully, when we're down in Atlanta, we definitely connect. One thing I wanted yeah, to please. ask you, yeah, of course, man. And one thing I wanted to ask you prior to to hopping off 
Uh, we typically ask our guests to contribute to, uh, to something we call the commercial real estate treasure chest. It's a repository of resources that we make available to our audience. And, you know, people have contributed helpful PDFs, spreadsheets, you know, anything really that you think would gain, uh, give value to the audience. So if you don't mind, what do you want to contribute today? Yeah, yeah, I'll send it over to you. Um, you know, talking about all the struggles of getting into commercial real estate, I, I made this guide. It was, um, I kind of joked, it was the limited guide to getting into commercial real estate. And it was pretty, pretty much just a, I think it's like five pages long. And it was like, here's my story, here's what happened, and here's all the things that um, I did wrong, and here's how you could, you know, do better. Here's classes you need to take, books you need to read. So I think anybody that's trying to get into the industry, that, that would be a great place to start. Because, it, I mean, it's all the classes and books that I really, I wish I knew about before, you know, going through a couple of years of kicking dirt. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's one thing. That I think the industry, Raphael can really speak to this, is uh, they kind of throw you out to the wolves in the, in the most part. It's like, hey, it, it sink or swim, you know, uh, like you said, kick dirt and figure it out on your own. Uh, yeah. But I think more, I think people are finally figuring out uh, the value of actually, you know, training people at the beginning and how much growth that they do and which in turn helps them and lifts them up and i think they're finally realizing that it's yeah. it's being slow in, in my opinion but it's coming around so. yeah it's an outdated idea of it was hard for me it should be hard for you yeah yeah it's like a badge of honor it's like oh yeah, yeah like you know we made it through this time frame it's like yeah you may have made it through but you know look at you lost a few teeth in the pro you know <laughs> it's like yeah. you know if you if you can and, and and not to say make it easier because again it's one of those professions that requires you to produce but at the end of the day in order for you to navigate the waters that is commercial real estate it's important to have someone that you can lean on and someone that can bring you in occasionally on different opportunities so that you can learn from someone who's been in the business for a long period of time and so similar to you right. what i what i always recommend is like you need to find someone who's going to take an interest in you and obviously you're yeah. you need to put in the legwork i mean no one's going to just hand you things but again yeah. if you're willing to put in the legwork go to an organization go to a company go to a team that's going to really invest in your success so right yeah, yeah. paramount, I mean, paramount. y'all thanks so much this has been it's been really great oh absolutely yeah. man no it's yeah. been an honor to like i said to 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 have a conversation with you yeah absolutely and Tim, I know more and more people are going to want to reach out to you, uh, whether it be coming to Atlanta and running the belt line or, uh, you know, how to do that or, you know, maybe sit, uh, calling you for a deal. Uh, what is one of the ways that you'd like them to get get in contact with you? Yeah, I just look me up on LinkedIn. My email and cell phone are right there. Just call me anytime. Um, if you're coming to Atlanta, we'll go get I almost said we'd, we'd go get the varsity, but that's that's like our famous restaurant. You get sick from from eating there. We'll we'll go somewhere else. But we'll go get it. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Somewhere on the belt right. line, right? That's no, yeah, we'll, yeah. There you go. Yeah, there there you targets. go. No, no. But we'll yeah. we'll uh we'll go ahead and include his contact information in the show notes as well. So if you guys are watching this on YouTube, go ahead and description. You guys can access that. Or if you guys are listening to this in a podcast format, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, really any type of uh, podcast format, we distribute on all the different ones. Feel free to go in the description below and you can access that as well. So. Again, Tim, thank you so much for stopping by. If you guys are watching this on YouTube, we would greatly appreciate it if you could like and subscribe to this channel. It really helps with the YouTube algorithm and ensures more and more people can hear this message. If you guys are listening to this in a podcast format, whether it's Spotify or Apple Podcasts, we would greatly appreciate it if you could go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. It makes a huge impact in the actual reach we've achieved. We've seen a significant, a significant uptick of our downloads as a result of you guys leaving five-star reviews, so we would greatly appreciate it if you did so. Again, thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you all next time.